kind of gather right there if you would so you can hear me. Um, what we didn't get to do today is um, today in Georgia history, but if you noticed it um, written on the board today, January 19th, um, 1861, Georgia seceded from the Union. And I think that's a, a it's an important date for us to remember because it's a date of an ending, but it's also a date of new beginning. Um, and I think it's it's pertinent to us today as we begin to talk about the Civil War in Georgia, particularly um, Sherman coming to Milledgeville. We're kind of jumping forward in time a little bit um, from 1861 to 1864, November of 1864 to be exact. Um, and I think it's kind of neat that we're doing it on this day because that time period from November 20th to November 24th, 1864, is really when the Confederacy um, is done. Um, the war is pretty much over by the time Sherman makes it um, to Savannah in December of 1864. Um, if you look at a calendar in April of 1865, um, uh, Lee surrenders at Appomattox and the Civil War is essentially over. Um, so I think it's important that, that we're doing this today. Now, a couple of things that I want to share with you as we go through this. You can jot some things down. Um, November 20th, 1864, the 14th and 20th Corps are in Putnam County. They're about 27 miles from Milledgeville. They're at a place called Murder Creek. It's about 30,000 Union soldiers. Now, to give you an idea of how many people that might be, if you've been to a Braves game in Truist Stadium, um, you've probably been in a stadium with roughly 35 to 40,000 people. So hopefully that gives you an idea of the number of people that would be gathered marching toward Milledgeville. Again, they're only about 27 miles from Milledgeville at this point in time. Um, on... Um, November 20th, there's 30,000 men. There's about 700 different vehicles, wagons, ambulances, caissons. There are roughly 30 artillery pieces. There's about 12,000 horses and mules. There's another 5,000 heads of cattle that are all marching down dirt country roads to converge on Milledgeville. On November 22nd, 1864, um, the lead column of the 20th Corps marches into the city. November 22nd, 1864. Jackson Street is about four or five blocks to the west. They come in on Jackson Street. They take a left onto Green Street, right out here in front of them. And Green Street doesn't look much different today. It was dirt but it essentially looked like that. Down where the Magnolia State Bank is was the Milledgeville Hotel. The Presbyterian Church sat on the corner. There was a Methodist Church sitting right on the other side of the gates here. And the Baptist Church sat down on the corner of Green and Elbert Street. So not 30,000 men, but roughly 15,000 men marching to Milledgeville they come down Green Street, they have flags flying, the band is playing the Battle Hymn of the Republic. Everybody know that song? Mine eyes have seen the glory of the coming of the Lord. It comes out of the Civil War and becomes actually a church hymn, believe it or not. But it was a war song. And they're playing it as they march past the State House. None of this was here. The gates weren't here. None of these buildings were on State House Square except those four churches that I mentioned. So they come marching by, they go to the end of <clears throat> the end of Green Street and they march across the River Bridge, which was essentially in the same place it is now. And, and they camp just on the other side of the Oconee River, about initially about 15,000 men in the 20th Corps. Now as they march by, they have two units that stop right here. One is the 107th New York, and the other is the 3rd Wisconsin. 
and they both camp on State House Square. So you've got horses, you've got men, you've got tents, you've got campfires. It's November and it is cold. It's Thanksgiving week. And the people of Milledgeville are gonna find they have very little to be thankful for and very little to celebrate Thanksgiving with because they're hungry. So provost duty, guard duty, the 107th New York and the 3rd Wisconsin. Now, one of the neat things about the 3rd Wisconsin, and if you'll remember back to the Indian Removal Act, everybody remember that? What did that do? Moved all the Indians in the United States east or west of the Mississippi River. Well, the 3rd Wisconsin has with them a group of Chippewa Indians. And given what happened here, the debate about the Indian removal in the Cherokee, it's kind of ironic that Villageville would be occupied by a group that has Chippewa Indians in it. Um, let's walk down to the corner and let me share some things there. And then we're going to walk to the Episcopal Church and we'll end up at the steps on the west side of the Capitol. Uh, Capitol. His name has showed up. Follow me. Remember rule number one. Y'all turn, y'all get in there and look at me. Just stand in there and look at me. All righty. So this is this doesn't have a lot to do with Sherman coming through, but I just kind of want to paint a picture for you of what Milledgeville would have been like in 1864. Um, the Episcopal Church, which is the brown building next door, we're going to stop in just a second, um, is the oldest church building in Milledgeville. It was built in the 1840s on ground given by the state of Georgia. Presbyterian Church has been here not quite as long. And then again, as I mentioned a few moments ago, the Methodist Church, just this side of the North Gates, and then the Baptist Church down in the corner of Green and Elbridge Street. Um, across the street where the Magnolia State Bank is was the Milledgeville Hotel. In fact, if you look at the sign there, it says, the Milledgeville Hotel and Oliver Hardy. We talked about Oliver Hardy yesterday, right? Uh, Stan Deaton in Today in Georgia History talked about Oliver Hardy. So he actually worked there. Um, during the Civil War, during Sherman's occupation of Milledgeville, that was the Milledgeville Hotel. Um, on Green Street right here, you would have had cotton bales lined up, uh, ready to go to Savannah, ready to go to the reason I want to stop here is because where you're standing right now, where we're standing right now, is where the slave market was in Milledgeville. And so when Sherman came through here in 1864, this is where people were being bought and sold. And it's always been ironic to me that within sight and hearing of four churches was the slave market a place that brought misery into people's lives inside of places where uh, people are supposed to find hope. And, and to me, it kind of gives you an idea of, of how ingrained slavery was in society in the South. People that worshiped God on Sunday morning didn't give a second thought about buying or selling another human being. Um, and I, I think it's important that you guys recognize that there's not a day goes by that I don't drive by here that that doesn't come to mind what happened in this place and that that's um, I hopefully helps you understand the importance of place as we study history it's one thing to oh yeah the slave market was right over there but to come and stand where it was um, I think brings it home to you, or at least I hope it does. All right, we're gonna walk down to the Episcopal Church, sit on the front steps, 
and then we're going to go to the Capitol building. So let's let's walk that way. Sit on the step. Get to sit down. So you are seated in front of St. Stephen's Episcopal Church. And as I mentioned a few moments ago, it is the oldest church building in Baldwin County. Built in the early 1840s um, by the Episcopal Church, of course. Um, and again, all, all in this area, you would have the 107th New York and the 3rd Wisconsin camped out. So they're, again, there are campfires, there's tents, uh, there are horses everywhere. Um, and for some reason that I never could figure out until recently, the 107th New York took a lot of pleasure in causing pain to the Episcopal Church. I couldn't figure out why until, again, just recently. Um, they broke into the church, they tore out the pews, they used those pews as firewood. It's cold. It is bitterly cold in Milledgeville in November of 1860. Um, they decide that this would make a fine stable, so they take their horses inside and use it as a stable. In fact, if you ask the right people, if you happen to show up here sometime and ask the right people, um, they might pull back the carpet and show you the hoof prints that are still there in the floorboards of the church. Um, as they are leaving Milledgeville, they decide that the organ needs a little sweetening, and so they pour molasses in the pipe organ. And if you know anything about pipe organs, molasses and pipe organs don't mix very well. And so it destroyed the pipe organ. And there's a, an end to that story, and we'll actually end with that in just a little bit. Now, the 14th Corps is camped um, about nine miles northwest of the city at Cobb's Quarter. Um, General Sherman is with the 14th Corps, and they are, um, they're bivouacked, they're camping there. Um, they're trying to find Sherman a place to stay because he's a general, and he doesn't want to sleep in a tent. And they find the caretaker's house for a plantation. Well, it turns out it's Howell Cobb's plantation. Howell Cobb <clears throat> had been an outspoken proponent of secession. He was pro-slavery, and presently in 1864, he was a general in the Confederate Army. He had been the Secretary of State for the Confederacy, had argued with Alexander H. Stevens about secession, and had won. And so Sherman finds that out, and he decides to burn Howell Cobb's plantation to the ground. And as they are leaving on the evening of the 22nd or the morning of the 23rd, Howell Cobb's plantation is in ruins. And if you go out there today, um, you won't find even the foundation of Howell Cobb's plantation house. Um, let me tell you about a couple of people, because history is all about people, right? There are two people. One is David Snelling. S-N-E-L-L-I-N-G. David Snelling. David Snelling is 26 years old. He's a first lieutenant in the Alabama Cavalry Union. He is a member of a cavalry unit that was raised up from Alabama that is fighting for the U.S. Army. What makes David Snelling unique is that he is from Milledgeville. And initially, he joined the Confederate Army, a group of volunteers from Baldwin County. He deserts. He runs away and joins a Union outfit and rises to the rank 
a first lieutenant. In 1864, he is William Sherman's personal escort. He's almost like his bodyguard. Where Sherman goes, there's gonna be David Snelling. And it's really important because he knows this area. He's from Milledgeville. He knows the people and the people know him. And so he serves a very important role for William Sherman during that time. Um, kind of a, a pretty neat story happens while Snelling is in a meeting with other officers. A slave happens to pass by the doorway, sees David Snelling, runs to him and wraps his arms around his knees and begins to offer him thanks for coming to rescue him. Even though Snelling had been his former master, he now saw that in wearing the Union uniform, he was his savior. And so that was kind of a neat thing. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Snelling also visits some family while he's here. Um, we don't really know the truth of that. Snelling said it went fine. It was cordial. Um, his uncle recorded in the plantation ledger that he brought Union Army troops with him and they ransacked the place and then left. So we, we really don't know. Um, the only written record is what the plantation owner wrote. Now, the other guy's a lot more colorful. We'll put it that way. His name is Rufus. Rufus Kelly. Rufus was a Confederate veteran, had fought many battles, particularly in Virginia. And during one of those, he lost a leg. Well, you lose a leg, you lose a limb, and you're retired from the Army. So they sent him home to Gordon, Georgia, just down the road. Rufus Kelly is a part of a group of 600 men who are under the command of the Attorney General, Attorney General Wayne of the state of Georgia. The Attorney General has 600. The 17th Corps, which is the western arm of Sherman's army, is coming through Macon toward Gordon. Wayne hears about it, and he does what any sane person would do. What do you think he did? He left. He got on a train, and he left. Made Rufus Kelly mad. Rufus Kelly is so mad that he finds the Attorney General of the state of Georgia, dog cusses him, and then gets his horse, his crutches, and his rifle. So he climbs on his horse, he straps his crutches to his saddle, he's got his rifle, he goes out to meet an army of 15,000 men. One man with one leg, on one horse, with one rifle, and one shot. He fires his shot, turns to run around, or turns his horse to run away, and falls off. He's captured. He's tried. He's sentenced to death. But before they can execute him, he escapes. Now I want you to think about that for just a second. How does a one-legged man escape from prison? I don't know. He had to crawl. But anyway, he escapes and he goes back and lives out his life in, um, in Gordon. Um, the Episcopal Church. Why does the 107th New York pick on the Episcopal Church? Why do they stable their horses here? Why do they burn the pews? Why do they pour the molasses in the pipe organ? Well, as we're leading up to the Civil Wars, we're in that period that we call um, separationism or separatism. Um, the Episcopal Church in the South spoke out in favor of secession. They were pro-slavery. And so as um, northern troops would come through a southern town with an Episcopal Church, they would typically take out their frustration on the Episcopal Church. So that's the reason why um, this church was vandalized the way it was. Now, one thing, and then we're going to walk up to the Capitol building. The old Capitol building is 
Gothic architecture. It looks like a castle, right? But it's, it's actually called Gothic architecture. If you look at the windows and the doors, they all have an arch. And Eli just turned around and looked at that door. What did you see? An arch. This is Gothic architecture also, but it is a different type. It's called Carpenter Gothic. Anybody know why? Because it's made out of what? It's made out of wood. Simple answer, right? All right, let's walk up to uh, the old Capitol building and we'll, we'll finish there, okay? Uh. All right, dudes, y'all have a seat. Of course, y'all are going to go all the way. To Why are you going to go all the way to the top? So, November, really November 20th through the 24th is when um, the 14th and the 20th Corps are in Milledgeville. Things don't really start to happen until about November 22nd, November 23rd. In fact, November 23rd, 1864 is the one full day that the Union Army is occupying Milledgeville. And it's on that day that we probably have the most acts of vandalism. Um, part of, of the standing order for the Union Army is to take anything that is useful, anything that can be used by the Confederate Army, um, you need to take. Anything that can be used by the citizens of the South, of Georgia in this case, you need to take. And so troops were going into people's homes, they would take food, whatever food was left, they would take silver, they would take anything that could be used by the Confederacy. Um, and they would either take it to use for themselves or they would destroy it. So that's what's happening on November the 23rd, 1864. Um, Milledgeville is one big army. I mean, it's one big army camp. And anything that can be burned is being burned because again, it is bitterly cold in November of 1864. Um, at one point in time, there was a picket fence that went all the way around State House Square. It became firewood. Um, again, because it is so cold and because the soldiers are trying to stay warm um, as they are in camp. I had always heard that only the Cobb Plantation was burned. And then, as I was doing some research a couple of weeks ago, I found out that was not the case. There were two additional plantations that were burned. One was owned by Judge Iverson L. Harris. And his plantation is burned because he had told other planters, other plantation owners, to destroy anything of use so that the army would either surrender or starve because Sherman's troops are not carrying supplies with them. They're basically living off the land. And so his plan is don't leave them anything. And so when they come to him, they burn his plantation down. The other is owned by a man named William Jarrett. And William Jarrett's only crime was his caretaker a man by the name of Patrick Kane was a fiery red-headed Irishman and he had a fiery temper to go with his red hair. And he decided that he would take a stand and he said the wrong thing to the wrong person and they shot him and killed him. And then they burned the plantation to the ground. And so Patrick Kane becomes the only fatality uh, during the entire occupation of Milledgeville. Um, I mean, even Rufus Kelly, you know, gets away with his life. Um, in addition to that, there were two houses in town that were burned. One was owned by um, Jeff Jones, or John Jones, rather. 
Um, he was the state treasurer, and his house was burned simply because he was at home and he was a member of the government. And so they burned his house to the ground. Um, again, houses are, are ransacked, although not all are. Some houses are actually guarded by the army because uh, the owners are either um, friends of influential northerners or are from the north and had moved south or um, are related to somebody that General Sherman knew. The old story was Sherman had a girlfriend in Milledgeville. Don't think that was true, um, but it would explain why he doesn't make a, a, a total mess out of the city. After all, it was the capital of Georgia. Um, and Georgia has to fall in order for the Confederacy to fall. So not every house is ransacked. Some are actually guarded. Um, Sherman's plan, his philosophy, is to um, lay waste to everything in his path. It is a scorched earth plan of, of war. But interestingly enough, um, when he leaves Milledgeville on November the 24th, 1864, there are some things still standing that you would have thought he would have made sure to destroy. There is, um, There are two large cotton warehouses left standing. There is the flour mill that's on the Oconee River left standing. There are two textile mills also on the Oconee that are left standing. There's an iron and brass foundry where they make things of iron and brass, of course, that he leaves standing. So he doesn't destroy um, everything in his path. The reason being those places I mentioned were owned by uh, people from New England who had settled in Georgia or by foreigners who had immigrated to Georgia and really had no tie to the Confederacy except that they lived here and worked here. Um, as he's leaving on August, or excuse me, November the 24th, he burns the Central and Georgia Railroad Station. Um, that would be an important thing. He's already torn up the track. Um, and then as he is leaving town, they burn the toll bridge across the Oconee River. Now, one reason they do that is so the Confederate Army can't pursue. <laughs> Reminds me of me. So they can't pursue the Army. But the Confederate Army is nowhere to be found. The other reason is so that the slaves won't follow the Army. Now, on the morning of November 24th, there is a grand celebration going on in downtown Milledgeville. There's not a single white person to be found unless they're a Union soldier. Every slave from every plantation, every slave that lived down in the bottoms near the river was in downtown Milledgeville, Georgia, dressed in their finest clothing, and they were having a celebration. They were celebrating the fact that for the first time in their lives, freedom was within their grasp. And it's, for some of them, it's that day. For others, it'll be a few months later. But that freedom is within their grasp, and they are celebrating. Uh, they are grabbing soldiers. They're hugging them. They're kissing them. Um, those that are in charge, the officers, are a little worried about the number of women running around, afraid they'll be taken advantage of. I need to get y'all to do that every day. Just run up down the road. No? All right. So, one last little thing. Again, the 107th and the 3rd Wisconsin are camped out all around the Capitol building. On the east side of the Capitol building, there is a magazine. Now, a magazine is a place you would store gunpowder, ammunition, that kind of thing. Somewhere over in here, probably about where that magnolia tree is right there, was the state arsenal. And that's where you would store weapons. Um, when the 3rd Wisconsin and 107th New York opened these buildings, um, it was pretty pitiful. In the arsenal, there are not guns. There are a few, but mostly there are 
swords, pikes, which is like a spear, um, weapons that are really obsolete. So they blow the building up. They blow this one up. Every window in the Capitol building is shattered. They blow the magazine on the other side. Again, the other side, every window is shattered. Um, the Episcopal Church, poor old Episcopal Church. Um, in 1864, the roof was actually flat. It wasn't that peaked roof. But on the morning of November 24th, the roof came off of that building. When they blew up the arsenal, it, it took off the church building or the church roof. And um, so the Episcopal Church um, has no pews. They have no roof. Their pipe organ has been destroyed. And they probably more than any other group of people in Milledgeville suffer the most at the hands of the Union Army. Um, they're able to rebuild somewhat, but they're not able to replace their organ. Forty years later, 1907, roughly, there's a gentleman in New York who hears about what the 107th New York had done to the Episcopal Church here in Milledgeville. He contacts the church and offers to buy them a new organ and actually sends them a check and they're able to purchase a new organ some 40 years after the Civil War, after Sherman had come through. Now, that's kind of a neat story and it's kind of a story of, of healing and reconciliation that takes place between the people of New York and the people of Milledgeville. Now, one other thing, the third Wisconsin, when they left Milledgeville, they took the keys to the building and they still have them. And they won't give them back. We have asked. And they're like, nope, they're our keys. We're keeping them. So um, remember November 19th, or excuse me, January 19th, 1861, um, in the legislative chambers, um, Georgia meets and they vote to secede. Um, and again, November of 1864, um, that decision um, is not justified in any way. And in fact, what Alexander Stevens had said, uh, if Georgia secedes, they will come to economic ruin. Well, that's what we see in November of 1864. There is nothing left to eat in Milledgeville. I mentioned that November 24th was Thanksgiving. There was nothing to feast upon that day. And in fact, as the army leaves, and they leave their campsites, the residents of Milledgeville go picking through the garbage, trying to find enough to survive on. Um, and the end result, Savannah Falls, and then in April of 1865, um, Lee surrenders at Appomattox Courthouse, and the war is essentially over. All right, any questions? Of course not. All right, let's go. I'll go back to class.